Resting into a posture that feels right for your body. Breathing in, breathing out, inviting a connection right here. Feeling any experience of body. Just practicing non-resistance. Remembering that non-resistance is not a piercing, not a piercing kind of driving into anything. It's a relaxed, receptive willingness to say yes, even if there's a no. Sensations feel like this. Movement of energies feel like this. Nothing has to be a problem. Nothing that we feel. Everything is nature. Everything is lawful. Trusting the movements of heart in and out of experience. Finding some distance, getting a little closer. This is really natural. It's not even something we have to be in charge of just interested in the natural ways that the heart connects and then backs off a bit. Notice is something else. Returns to a previously known experience. Just go with the flow together for the next few minutes.
Feel free to stretch your legs if you'd like. I'd like to share some reflections tonight on this particular form that we call a retreat and really the power of renunciation. And for those of you who are new to retreating, I'm wondering if this is what you expected the ups and downs, the beauty and the difficulty. It's so much. Right? This particular form is really a container that makes us more sensitive and we become more intimate with life in ways that we we didn't really, you know, I can speak for myself, I didn't really know possible and I certainly didn't think it was gonna be hard. <laughs> Not as hard as it is. Retreating can be hard, right? Can I get an amen on that one? <laughs> yeah, some moments are. And if we expand the definition of a retreat, because we can do this, you know, retreating is just an elongated version of what we call our life, right? These moments in our life where we learn to be, or we choose to be really intentional. And so we can expand the definition of a retreat to include all of these moments. In this particular style of practice that we've been doing, where we're really receptive to life on life's terms, and we're not so much directing the attention here or there, but we're just receiving experience as it is, life as it is, we're going with the flow and learning how to be, learning how to surrender to that. This particular form can be really supportive in transitioning to our daily lives. Right. And in our daily lives, these little mini retreats that we have when we're really sincere about learning when we're there, right there with the warm water, when we're washing the dishes or we're fully in our bodies and we're taking a shower and we're feeling the cold water and the warm water and our preferences for this or that and our likes and dislikes. When we're attuning with a loved one, having an intimate conversation and feeling all the tugs of the heart in the relational context there. This is all practice. These are what we might call many many retreats where we're just so sincere and intentional and present right? and learning how to not take life so personally, learning how to go with the flow, learning how to get what we get. Yeah, in kindergarten, I used to, I'm no longer working in schools very much these days, but I used to work in schools quite a lot. And sometimes in kindergarten, teachers would say, you know, at lunchtime or when there's a shared, like sharing pencils or tools or something, you get what you get and you don't have a fit. And that's really hard to do. Right? It's, it's almost impossible in some moments. Human beings, we have so many preferences for everything. But we can really practice um, giving ourselves wholeheartedly over to our life in so many moments of our day even if it's for a short, a short time while we're on retreat, right? when we're doing our yogi jobs or transitioning from one thing to another. Like Mark said, the best time to practice is when we're waiting. That's such a, uh, oh, there's a lot going on in a moment of waiting. The mind has a lot of suggestions, <laughs> wants a lot of things. sitting for a half hour, sitting for a weekend retreat, 
marking our life with these kinds of ceremony, right? It's a kind of ceremony to really give ourselves over. Yeah. Be there for it. And we might call this whole Buddhist path the path of renunciation. But it doesn't have to be a downer. It might sound like that, renunciation. And there is a, uh, there is, you know, renunciation we might say is also letting go. So it's true that we learn how to let go. The heart learns how to shed some of its preferences, some of its needs for getting things exactly how we want them to go or be. But renunciation is also a radical, like points us in the direction of a radical belonging, right? Every, we learn that everything belongs. Nothing has to be pushed away because everything is a part of this path of learning. Everything supports our learning. Every experience is our teacher. Every encounter with another human being is our teacher. It's a possibility to learn something from this. A wonderful Tibetan teacher that many of you probably know, Pema Chodron, talks about renunciation as an act of learning how to not hold back. Or she says, to open to the teachings of the present moment, which I really love. To open to life as it is. To not hold something back, just to receive. To receive it as it is. Not, to not hold back our sincerity or our wholeheartedness heartedness, until conditions are more perfect than they are. But to really be intimate, to feel what's there to feel about this. We learn that the present moment as our teacher we learn with the present moment as our teacher that you know, how often we grasp after something. Pema Chodron also says that renunciation is realizing that our nostalgia for wanting to stay in a protected, limited, petty world is insane. And we kind of learn this as we go along. It's a radical notion to be intimate. And you might be noticing your minds right now, like, all the dodges, all the blocks to that. Well, except in this, or except in these conditions, or you know, whatever that is. And so, part of waking up to a a kind of belonging that feels really radical is also um, waking up to a kind of vulnerability that we feel that we experience, right? that we understand. We never, and this isn't meant to, again, be a downer, but it's just real. Right? We, we never know how life is going to go from one moment to the next. So we do the thing that doesn't make any logical sense to us as human beings. We surrender. <laughs> and why do we surrender? because we've tried everything else. And although this and that might work for a while, it won't work forever. You know, sure, some nice ice cream here or there, a good meal out, or a nice sunny day, or indulging in this fantasy because it feels good, or trying so hard to be good. These are all momentary happinesses, right? but they all end. And so we learn that when we drop the trying to be good, what's left is a whole lot of sincerity. And sincerity is really attractive. You know, it actually is attractive to ourselves. We're, we can be, we can feel good about that. Do you know authentic people? All of us do. And it's easy to be drawn to them. There's something that feel, that, that sincerity that feels really good to be around. Surrendering, renouncing, letting go, even though it might be um, what we learn 
is the only way to happiness, real sustainable way to happiness, it's still hard. Let's be honest. Because we want to hold on. Even though we know what the Buddha said, that the cause of suffering is clinging. Human beings hold on, hold on, hold on. Confused, deluded human beings hold on. Because we're such safety-seeking creatures and it's really hard for our systems to open to the vulnerability that we live with. So we create these, these kind of, like a kind of ground that we can rest in for a moment, even though it won't last. And sometimes those kind of grounds are like good skillful means, right? Really to bask in the sun when the sunny day is here. It's not like we expect the sun to stay forever, but we're really gonna take it in because it supports a kind of grounding in the nervous system, for example. But more often the, the way that we engage the present moment is by bartering, right? Well, I'll give a little effort here if you give me sunshine or I'll be present for this meal if, if you promise it to be pleasant or of my favorite foods or at the right time rationalizing and just rationalizing our holding on even on retreat right i've noticed this is just my watching my own mind these reflections come right from my own experience wanting the dharma to sound a particular way wanting the instructions to sound or be a particular way we want practice to go like this or not like that right we might want dinner at a slightly different time, or if only someone could make us dinner, then I'd really be able to practice. Or I can't do a Zoom retreat because, fill in the blank. Oh, I really want to indulge this thought. I really want to think about this because it's pleasant and I deserve it. It's been a hard day. I need it, right? Something like that. Not if you've seen any of these today. Yeah. I'd love not to say this, but you know, even at this point in practice, after almost 20 years, I, you know, this, this happens all the time. I was on retreat this summer and I, this is, you know, common on retreat. I have done quite a number of solo retreats where I'm off by myself. This time I had a lovely stay in the tiny house at the retreat center. And I can get really attached to a routine. And I noticed this one day, I, I, had, I had a routine where I'd get up early and I would do my routine. And then one day it rained and I couldn't walk the loop. And that's what I had tended to do. That was part of my routine on that day. And that's not at all what I wanted. And it, it, even though it wasn't a big drama, a small drama, I did notice it like, wow, sweetie, you really want to do what you want to do, huh? Even here on retreat, when the whole path is about letting go, the mind still doesn't want to do that, still wants to hold on to this. I ran out of oat milk. Oh, now what will I do? Right? <laughs> Just such simple ways. And I'd love to say that, you know, after 20 years, retreat is just peaceful all the time. But it's not like that in every moment. But what's more true now than ever is that there is a, a deep sense of faith and trust in letting go. That holding on to oat milk or the sunshine or a routine or a good sit even, right? a mind that's concentrated, it really isn't worth it. And yet the habits still kick in because they're just human habits. And so this sense of belonging that can creep in with time and patience and just a gentle persistence or remembering to relax. Everything belongs. Even this, even this mind that's revolting against this, even this mind that doesn't like what the teacher's saying even this mind that doesn't want things to be this way, right? That kind of 
letting go the willingness of the heart to let go of clinging to anything is a little more possible than it used to be. And these are some ordinary experiences that we have on, that we have on retreat when you know a lot of things are provided for us and life can get really simple right? but then there are these big moments in our lives when you know our, our own health or the health of a loved one is really challenged or a crisis of some sort is right in front of us and the heart doesn't want to surrender to the con definitely doesn't want to surrender to the conditions then a number of years ago, I had a, a pretty significant health challenge, one that rocked me and one that I didn't know how it would resolve or if it would resolve. And I remember watching, this just came back up to me today because a friend asked me, when did I start healing or how did I know that I was healing? And I really had to think about that. Oh, it's when there was an amount of surrender there when the heart was really start really started surrendering to not knowing right not to healing or to non-healing but to not actually knowing i don't know how this is going to go right but in so many moments watching myself search the internet or make doctors appointments and there's nothing wrong with doing those things but it was the the heart that was compelled to resolve something or find an answer that was really the cause of suffering, that wanting, that clinging, not wanting it, there to be a problem with the body, not wanting there to be sickness. Though we know that sickness, we know that aging is a normal part of life. And so this element of renunciation that is about surrendering, it's sur surrendering to the present moment, not adding anything, not being in contention with the present moment, also includes learning to let the heart break in. Right? When we feel that entanglement of clinging, because right? that will be there for us. It will be our teacher. There's so many moments of suffering, so many opportunities to surrender. And many moments to practice, you know, in simple ways with surrender that the heart just ignores. And sometimes it's these big things when life brings us to our knees, and it will at some point if it hasn't already, that we feel the power of surrender. Death, for example, is a remarkable teacher in this way, in its finality, right? There's no choice. And we can feel that. I don't. The heart is really longing for a little more time or for this not to go this way and wanting to reverse it, even though there's no changing how it's going. My beloved, a, be a beloved friend of the four legged kind just recently passed away. A cat who I've loved for 21 years. It's a very long relationship. And I was very, I feel so much gratitude to being able to do some work from home and spend a lot of time with her. She was right here with me most days and on the same floor. We had her contained to the best of our ability. And I watched the heart and all of its movements right, flow through these periods of deep acceptance and really some anguish, not wanting, even though I knew what was happening, it's very clear dying is happening it's happening right now right i would say this like look at her touch her pet her it's happening right now sweetie right and there was this, like a deep sincerity that was there wholeheartedness that was there in those moments and yet in other moments it was really hard to accept and as it should be right for us as human beings because we love so deeply and it's hard to love without attachment.
And the good news, there is some good news for us. Yeah. And that is that the heart learns how to surrender in its own ways and its own time. It's not like we need a whole program for how to live a simple life. Right? And in fact, if we lived on retreat, you know, we would still have these moments like I've just stated, even on my on retreats I've been in, I just noticed the heart that wants to cling to this or that in so many ways. So we could construct a little perfect existence for ourselves and the heart would still do what it does. So there is good news in that because we can continue to take refuge and it's really in the learning that presence is important. It's a high value, in fact, that mindfulness, awareness, living a life of presence is the highest value. And when, in my experience, when I am wholehearted about connecting and feeling embodied, this embodied existence, learning how to accept life on life's terms and feel it right here in an intimate way, then life gets more simple on its own. In fact, some of the activities that I used to like to do, I don't do very much anymore. And it becomes more important to, for example, spend time with my cat than it is to do other things, check emails or work at a frantic pace, like the presence and reverence for life and death really matters. And that's learned in moment in a moment by moment way as we live and work and do ordinary things. You know, when we decide to get up in the morning and even though we feel a little cranky about it, we do come into the hall and sit down at 630 right? And we're with the crankiness right there because that too belongs. Because being, what's the option? What's the other option? To keep fighting something that we're doing, it doesn't really help. We learn that, right? Because we feel it. And because we feel it, the heart learns like, oh, this doesn't make much sense. And so it learns how to let go on its own. Let me set down that contention, right? Perhaps Living, being simple is better. Not fighting is better. It makes, it makes sense because I can feel it. It feels like a, 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 an alignment is there with a truth of nature. Like, oh yeah, I'm not somehow trying to deny the seasons or that I live in an interconnected world or that my thoughts, actions, behaviors impact other people. I'm not trying to somehow pretend like that doesn't matter, or I'm not trying to pretend that laying in my bed and thinking, you know, meaningless thoughts is going to make life better for me. Simple is nice. It actually feels good to us. So the kind of, it might feel like work to let go, but it's not actually so much of that in my experience. The work, if you will, I'm not sure I'd really call it work, but it's just in remembering to value presence, to reflect on our intentions. Why do we care about being intimate? What's important about that? How does life work when this heart is willing to be intimate? when this heart is willing, willing to feel, even its confusion, right? Even aversion, what's that like? Is it supportive or not supportive? How does it if, affect the way I live? It's so radical what we're doing on retreat learning how to value intimacy like this, learning how to be really sincere, learning how to be simple. It's a radical kind of training. 
And we should feel really good that we're brave enough to do it. And when we beat ourselves up because it isn't going the way we want it to, to reflect on that, like, wow, this is a brave way to live. And like Mark said, the Dharma is for deluded people. <laughs> and thankfully we found it. So we can, we can know we're a deluded people. <laughs> we're among the group. And so why would it be different given that, right? Why would it not feel hard sometimes? Of course it's going to feel hard sometimes. I was another time, I'm going to share some re retreat stories tonight, but another time I was on a retreat at, at the retreat center. Again, I did a number of retreats before it was a retreat center and back when it was still a single family home and I stayed in the apartment, the room that we still call the apartment. And I, this one particular retreat, I was there by myself. I didn't even have a car and I had lots of time there. There were people in and out, a few here and there, but I had a, a large, a lot of time alone. And for whatever reason, it was a retreat that fear was a, a really common experience and even fear that tipped into terror. And I, I just did what we're all doing on this retreat. You know, do the best that I can to be intimate, learn the art of moving in and out, you know, this natural way that the heart learns, like I'm overwhelmed, refresh the awareness, find some way to stay balanced, look for some ground, even if it's fleeting, you know, the dirt. I did many walking, I did lots of walking practice in the middle of the night with my bare feet up and down the, used to be the dirt driveway. Now it's, it's got some um, rock there. Right, just to find some ground, enough balance for the mind to keep, to value, to remember that it's possible to be present. There's lots of skillful means that we employ like this. Right? And pleasant experience can be a real support. For a long time, for many, many days, it was, you know, I tried doing more walking than sitting. I tried opening the eyes really trying to notice that where the, you know, where fear tipped into terror and keep it on this side of terror because terror felt overwhelming and unbearable. And so just keep the fear as low as possible and see if that's, find some balance there. And because the mind was agitated enough, you know, it was the mind wasn't really sleepy in a reclining position. And I learned the value of pleasant experience by lying down on on the mattress underneath the window, the weather was really nice. There was a cool breeze flowing in right over my face. I can still remember that nice feeling on my face. It was just soothing enough and just allowing the heart to really take it in. Like, oh, this feels pleasant. It's, I feel it on my face. It, and to watch the heart settle a bit, settle a bit. The soft mattress felt good to the body. The warm breeze cool, warm air mixed together, sometimes, you know, felt, felt good and varied. And, and I spent many hours lying on my back right there, just learning how to, how to be in the present moment, how to be with conditions as they are, learning that sense of belonging, that everything belongs, nothing is, everything is lawful. It's all nature. It all, it's all supposed to be just like this and everything is workable. It doesn't always feel like that, but everything is workable. And the residue of that experience, even though it was hard, right? And there were moments when the heart did break over the suffering. There were some tears, right? Some crashing and falling apart. And a real surrender to like, yeah, this is it. It's like this. It is like this sometimes for human beings. And now the residue of that experience is that fear is not that daunting. It's not that scary. It's not that I hope to be afraid, but when the heart, when there is some anxiety or some fear or even strong fear, you know, it's okay. It can be there. 
because the heart has learned to be courageous in the face of something that felt really difficult. And this is how we build, how we grow, if you will, into more courageous human beings, more resilient human beings that are able and willing to stand up in the middle of life as it is. People who learn how to be there, we learn how to be there for ourselves in the hardest moments, and we can learn how to be there for each other too, right, in hard moments. We can learn to endure someone else's suffering. You know, it feels hard to watch a being suffer. And learning how to be intimate with our own suffering in moments where it feels difficult really helps us learn to be there with another and learn how to participate. Learn, learning how to participate. There's another quote by Pema Chodron. Let me see if I can find it for you. The whole journey of renunciation, she says, or starting to say yes to life is realizing, first of all, that you've come up against your edge, that everything in you is saying no, and then at that point, softening. Hmm. Softening. So I'll just end by saying thank you. Thank you for being on this radical journey. It's so wonderful to have a community to practice with. I hope you feel that too. And thank you for all your acts of courage so far and your willingness to be with your own experience to feel all the, the beauty of it and the challenge of it and to learn from it so that we can share that with each other and um, grow into the kind of community that we want to be, both here at Common Ground and in the world. Thanks, everyone. We'll have a bit of time for walking or movement practice now. We'll be back for the final sit of the night in about 35 minutes. <laughs>